Hello there and welcome to the Centre for Independent Studies. My name is Tom Switzer and I'm the Executive Director here at CIS. Now, for those of you tuning in who aren't familiar with CIS, we're a public policy research organisation. We've been around since 1976. We're primarily focused on domestic affairs and in coming months, we're especially interested in promoting what we think is a sound productivity enhancing economic reform agenda that will help Australia emerge stronger from the coronavirus crisis. Uh, this will be our first recession in nearly three decades. So we wanna put in place sound policies that sharpen incentives to create wealth and invest in our country's future growth and prosperity. But foreign policy is also a big issue for CIS and COVID-19 has affected our place in the world insofar as it has drastically raised tensions between China and the West. Of course, China is our largest trade partner. It accounts for about 36% of our export wealth, which when you think about it, is more than Japan, South Korea, and the United States combined. Chinese students also studying in Australian universities, they contribute as much as $12 billion a year in fees. Now, at the same time, the United States has been our most important security ally since the end of World War II and the onset of the Cold War. Australia has important values and interests in common with the US, reflected especially in intelligence sharing and favourable access to US defence and technology. On many issues in the world, Americans and Australians find ourselves on the same side. Which brings us to the coronavirus crisis. Now, the United States and its allies have expressed outrage at the way the communist regime in Beijing has dealt with the outbreak of the virus. Beijing has accused the United States of trying to smear and shift blame. According to Beijing, Washington should focus on controlling the outbreak at home. Meanwhile, a diplomatic spat is raging between Beijing and Canberra. China's ambassador here recently threatened economic retaliation over Canberra's call for an independent investigation into China's handling of the COVID-19 outbreak. So to discuss these issues and to put them in a broader historical context of the US-China relationship, this increasingly intense strategic and economic competition between our largest trade partner and our most important security ally, we have a great debate between two distinguished intellectual heavyweights, Kishore Mahbubani in Singapore and John Mearsheimer in Chicago. Now I'll introduce and call on both Kishore and John to make a two minute introductory statement before we address questions. Now for their introductory remarks, I would call on Kishore and John to address two key questions. The first, can China rise peacefully, which is the subject of the final chapter in John Mearsheimer's The Tragedy of Great Power Politics? And the second question is, is China winning, which is the subject of Kishore's new book? Well, let's get started. Kishore Mabulbani is author of Has the West Lost It? A Provocation. That was published two years ago. And just out, available in all good bookstores in Australia, Has China Won? The Chinese Challenge to American Primacy, which the distinguished military historian Sir Max Hastings and the leading CNN commentator Fareed Zakaria have recently praised. A former ambassador yes. to the United Nations yes. twice in the Reagan era and the post 9-11 era, Kishore Mabulbani was the founding dean of the Lee Kuan Yew School of Public Policy at National University of Singapore. Now, Kishore was a guest at CIS both in 2004 and two years ago in 2018. And it's a great pleasure to welcome him back to CIS. Kishore, over to you. Um, thank you very much. It's such a pleasure to be back with uh, John and you uh, in this discussion. Let me quickly answer your, your two questions. Your first one is, can China rise peacefully? And the simple answer is yes. Because one point I emphasize in my book as China won is that we are entering a new era of world history. 200 years of Western domination of world history is coming to an end, and we're returning to the norm of the first 1800 years, from the year one to the year 1820. Our two largest economies were always those of China and India. So we're going back to a different world. And remember that when China was dominant, uh, the number one power for most of 1800 years, China didn't conquer the world. 
China didn't go out like the British, the, the French, uh, the Dutch, and the Spanish conquering colonies all over the world. Indeed, in the I believe in the 15th century, they had the largest, most powerful navy under Emerald Cheng He. They went around the world. They didn't conquer any countries. So I think that's a very critical point to bear in mind with just one minor qualification. And this is an important for an Australian audience. As China is rising and returning, it's important that we try to work with China rather than try to provoke China. And that's why managing the rise of China uh, is very critical. Your second question is, uh, can China win? And the question is, win what? So clearly, if you mean in terms of can China become the world's largest economy, uh, I can confidently say yes. And you know, all that the Chinese have to do is achieve half the per capita income of the United States, and they will have an economy twice the size of the United States. Simple mathematics. But of course, if, the, if, if by can China win, do you mean that China will step in and take over the role of the United States and try and dominate the world? Uh, I don't think China wants to do that. And as, as John Mearsheimer, who's going to speak next, has brilliantly documented in his book, The Great Delusion, America fought a lot of unnecessary wars in the Middle East and elsewhere. This is something that China, I'm reasonably confident, is not interested in doing. It wants to focus on making China a great power, but not take over America's role in terms of managing the world. Kishore, thank you. And over to John Mearsheimer. Now, John is the author of The Great Delusion, Liberal Dreams and International Realities. It was published last year by Yale University Press. John's also the author of The Tragedy of Great Power Politics, which Foreign Affairs magazine rated as one of the three most influential theses of the post-Cold War era, the others being Frank Fukuyama's The End of History and Samuel Huntington's The Clash of Civilizations. John Mearsheimer is also a professor of political science at the University of Chicago. John was a guest of CIS just last August 2019, and you can watch his events, including a debate with Australia's leading strategic thinker, Hugh White, in Canberra, in front of more than 500 people. John, welcome back to CIS, and over to you. Thank you, Tom, for inviting me to be on the show. Uh, it's great to be back with you and also with my old friend, Kishore. Uh, I have very different views on these two questions than Kishore does. With regard to the question of whether, can, whether China can rise peacefully, I think the answer is no. My basic view is that what China is going to do as it continues to rise economically is that it's going to translate that economic might into military might, and it's going to try to dominate Asia the way the United States dominates the Western Hemisphere. It's going to try to become a regional hegemon, the way the United States is a regional hegemon here in the Western Hemisphere. My view is that China would be crazy not to try to dominate Asia, because in a world where there is no policeman, no night watchman, it makes eminently good sense for a state to want to completely dominate its region. So I think that China will set out to do that. Of course, the United States does not tolerate peer competitors. The United States wants to remain the only regional hegemon in the world, and it therefore will go to great lengths to prevent China from dominating Asia. And the end result will be that you'll get this intense security competition with a serious chance of war. With regard to the second question, we're very early in this competition. So it is hard to predict who's ultimately going to prevail. I think when you read Kishore's excellent book and you listen to him over the years, he thinks that the Chinese have the wind behind their back and that the United States is kind of like a dinosaur. Uh, I would not bet on that, Kishore. If I had to bet, I'd bet on the United States. The United States has taken on four potential peer competitors in its history. Imperial Germany, Imperial Japan, Nazi Germany, and the Soviet Union. The United States played a key role in putting all four countries, all four of those countries, on the scrap heap of history. 
the United States will go to great lengths to compete with China and to prevent it from dominating Asia. And when you look at uh, the demographics of China and the United States, and you look at the economies of the two countries, I think that the United States is in better shape than China is. And for that reason, if I had to bet, I'd bet on the United States. Well, John, thank you so much for that. And as you can tell here, John Mearsheimer and Kishore Mahbubani clearly take different views on this question about whether China can rise peacefully and uh, whether it's on the pro- in the process of uh, re- replacing America in terms of primacy in East Asia. I want to deal with these issues. And remember, if you'd like to ask any questions, just chat and we'll get the questions to our special guests uh, towards the end of the show. Uh, but I'd like to talk about what's really the big issue in, in international affairs uh, in the last week or so, and that is the question of an international inquiry into the Chinese government's handling of the outbreak of the coronavirus in Wuhan. Akishore Mahbubani surely calls for that inquiry are reasonable. After all, the virus was made in China. It's infected more than 3.5 million people. It's killed more than a quarter of a million people and it's triggered a global recession, perhaps even a depression. Uh, What's so wrong with an inquiry? Kishore Mabubani. Uh, Very small correction. Uh, The virus was not made in China. It exploded in China. As you know, viruses can break out anywhere. It was a natural phenomenon. Uh, And I think that China, in my view, will not be opposed to any objective, impartial, scientific inquiry into what's happened because they are as uh, eager as anybody else to find out what's happened. But it's important to understand that the calls for the inquiry are part of the politicization of this virus debate, an attempt to blame China, an attempt to put all the focus on China so that countries, especially I would say United States and some Western European countries can hide the fact that they were actually incompetent in their response uh, to this virus. And this is not sure Mabubani speaking. Let me, you know, Richard Horton is the editor of one of the most influential journals in the world, The Lancet, and this, this, is, he say, this is what he says. He says the reason why I've been very critical of the UK government, the US administration, and many European countries is because the Lancet published five papers, five, in the last week of January, telling exactly what was happening in China. And they're describing how the virus was deadly, it was killing people, number of deaths were rising, patients being admitted to ICU, there was no treatment for the virus, and he was going person-to-person transmission. He said all this information had been put out by the end of January. And guess what? US and many European countries did nothing in February, did nothing in March. The Chinese were puzzled. And then after having failed to respond, they want to try and hide the fact that they responded incompetently by trying to blame China. And even Farid Zakaria said a few days ago, I saw heard him say on CNN, this is clearly a political move. So if you if you can depoliticize the scientific inquiry and just keep it to the scientists, I'm sure China will cooperate with the scientists. Okay. Now, the Trump administration, of course, claims that the virus leaked from some lab in Wuhan and, and, and so far, it's failed to produce the, the, the relevant evidence. But John, I want to bring you in here. Uh, one Australian government security official has told the Sydney Morning Herald this week, quote, we can't repeat the mistakes of the past. The WMD's fiasco was not that long ago. This is referring to the incorrect intelligence reports in the United States and Britain that uh, Saddam Hussein's Iraq was developing WMD. Um, And, of course, that's formed the basis of the Iraq invasion in 2003. Is there a danger here that the Trump administration has mishandled these these calls for an international inquiry into Wuhan? John Mearsheimer. Well, I think that what the Trump administration is doing, and it's mainly at this point Secretary of State Mike Pompeo, uh, in saying that it's quite clear uh, that this virus escaped from a laboratory in Wuhan, is a major mistake. 
uh, there is no evidence to support that line of argument at this point. And in fact, the intelligence community in the United States is saying quite explicitly, we have no evidence to support what Pompeo is saying. There is no evidence to support what he's saying. Therefore, we, the United States, are going to end up with egg all over our face if we continue to make this argument that the virus uh, actually started in the laboratory in Wuhan and escaped, when in fact there's no evidence to support it. And the fact that we have this important precedent, which, you're talk which you talked about, which is the Iraq WMD case, it makes it all the more dangerous for the United States. The fact is the United States, when it comes to foreign policy in this day and age, oftentimes behaves in an inept way. And this is a really good example of the United States doing something that makes no sense, something that's not in its strategic interest. Well, where does all this put Australia? Because in the last two weeks, our prime minister and foreign minister have been vocaling, leading international efforts to call for an inquiry. And shortly after, I think the prime minister made a call for an international inquiry, the Chinese ambassador in Canberra, he hinted that Beijing might boycott Australia. He said, persist with the inquiry, essentially. This is what he warned, quote, Ordinary people in China might ask, why should we drink Australian wine? Why eat Australian beef? Now, far from uh, killing the inquiry, all it's done is uh, just infuriate both sides of federal politics. It's one of the few areas where uh, the coalition government and the Labor opposition agree. They're both united against China on this. Uh, Kishore Mabobani, surely China's so-called wolf warrior diplomacy, that's no way to win allies to its cause. Kishore. Well, you know, Tom, I, I'm trying, I'll try to speak to you as a friend of Australia. Uh, at the same time, I'm aware of how politically charged the atmosphere in Australia is, how strong the feelings against China are, and, and so it's very difficult uh, now to speak out, frankly, uh, on these things. But as a friend of Australia, I think it's important for Australians to grasp a few critical points. Number one, as I said, the, the era of Western domination of world history is over. And you're going to see the return of Asia. Now, Australia is not in Canada. Australia is in Asia. Now, as if all your neighbors have begun to carefully, gradually adjust to this new world that is emerging, and you insist on not changing or adapting to your new geopolitical environment, you will be creating problems uh, for yourself. And, you know, there are some iron laws of geopolitics. In fact, many of them are spelled out in John Mearsheimer's book, The Great Delusion. And I would say one of the iron laws of geopolitics uh, is never pull the tail of a tiger. And at a time when the tiger is already angry and lots of people are throwing stones at this tiger, you decide at that point in time to pull the, the tail of the tiger. So there, there, there's, there's some geopolitical wisdom in handling great powers carefully. This is, by the way, equally true uh, of the United States too. If you're a neighbor of the United States, you just got to be careful in how you manage the United States. And, and as I think I read somewhere recently, John Mearsheimer was saying in the book, how would the United States feel if suddenly the Russians came in and established bases in Mexico and in uh, Canada. And, and, and John wisely said that, of course, the United States would get very upset. So every country, and I agree with John here, that every country will worry about what's happening in its neighborhood. So, so Australia has got to be aware it's in the neighborhood and has got to develop a certain degree of geopolitical sensitivity uh, to this new environment. And so that, so it, I, I, to put it very simply and very succinctly, Australia's got to reboot its entire strategic thinking and decide how it's going to adapt to a new world. 
Well, following on from that, Kishore, John Mearsheimer, I mean, doesn't Kishore have a point that we need to be geopolitically sensitive to the rising power of China? It is our largest trading partner. It accounts for nearly 40% of our export wealth. We are in Australia probably heading into our worst recession since certainly the Great Depression in the 1930s. Aren't we vulnerable to China's economic coercion? I mean, what can we do to push back against these kind of Chinese threats? Should we become more diplomatic and move slowly but surely into the Chinese sphere of influence? Well, I have a different view of what's happening uh, in Asia and in the world more generally than Kishore. Kishore tends to see the situation in what I would call civilizational terms. He, he sounds a lot like Sam Huntington, right? He talks about Asia rising and the West declining. And it's as if Asia were this unified entity. And that's just not the case at all. The Japanese live in mortal fear of the Chinese, and both the Japanese and the Chinese, the last time I checked, are in Asia. The Indians are worried silly about the rise of China. So within Asia, you have all these cleavages, and you have a large number of countries in Asia that are economically tied to China in all sorts of ways, as you described Australia, but they also are strategically tied to the United States and they're very fearful of China. I would say for those states, and this of course includes Australia, yes, you have economic interests that will push you to side with China, but you also have strategic interests that will push you to side with the United States. And the $64,000 question is which way are you gonna go? And the answer is, you're going to go with the United States, you're going to go with the Japanese, and you're going to do everything you can to contain China, because it is big, and it is powerful, and it is threatening. Well, uh, in other words, uh, security trumps prosperity. Keisha, how would you respond to John Mearsheimer? Security trumps prosperity. Uh, uh, by the way, uh, you know, uh, uh, John will be very surprised to discover that I agree with him uh, quite a lot. And I certainly agree with you, John, that Asia is this large and diverse place. And I agree with you, John, that countries like Japan and India, uh, South Korea are all very worried about China's rights. It's a fact. I mean, certainly I'd be very, of course, if there was a, a small cat next to me that suddenly became a tiger, I'd be very worried too, you know? That's very natural. So, but at the same time, I, I, I would encourage Australia to watch how other Asians deal with China. For a sim simple example, uh, which I think George Cannon would have endorsed, the first thing you do is to insult <laughs> a great power, right? J the Japanese are very concerned, but at the same time, you notice how the Japanese are trying to make sure that their relations with China remain on an even keel. Modi and Xi Jinping have spent more time with each other talking face to face than any two leaders have in recent times. So they're, they're everybody, yes, we have to deal with the new China. And Australia, unfortunately, has not accepted the fact that this is a different China that you have to deal with. And, every, and, since every, and, and these adjustments, by the way, in Asia are very subtle, you know, very, very subtle changes going on. And I also want to emphasize, I agree with John, that most of the countries in this region want the U.S. to stay off this region. They would like to see a strong U.S. presence, but they would like to see a very tactful, diplomatic U.S. presence that doesn't force countries to choose. So you, it is possible, actually, to work out arrangements whereby you, China can rise uh, peacefully and we can all live in a relatively secure and stable environment. And doesn't the Trump administration, John, complicate matters? As you well know, the United States have five security allies in the region, Australia, Japan, South Korea, the Philippines and Thailand. It has security networks based throughout the Asia Pacific. Um, and the US alliance has been very much the centerpiece of Australian foreign policy. Uh, but John Mearsheimer, how does Australia respond to an ally in the words of a mutual friend of all three of ours, Owen Harries, the distinguished foreign policy thinker who used to be a senior fellow here at CIS? How does Australia respond to an ally that is, quote, inconsistent, chaotic, uh, 
and championing insularity. John Mishama. Well, let's take those words one by one. Champion, championing insularity, that sort of implies isolationism, like the United States wants to leave the region. And I know from when I was in Australia in August of last year, this is August 2019, there are a number of Australian strategists who think the United States is not going to be there for Australia, that we're going home. That is not happening. There is absolutely no evidence that the United States is leaving East Asia. Uh, we're building up our military capabilities in Northern Australia. We're increasing, increasing uh, our patrols in the South China Sea. We're deploying more and more military forces to the region. We're not going away. The United States is bent on containing China. So on that dimension, there's no problem at all. The United States does behave in a quite ham-fisted way in foreign policy these days. And when you look at how the United States manages its relations, you look at the micro level at how the United States operates in East Asia today, it's quite clear that we're not doing a very good job. And I blame this mainly on the Trump administration. I think that will change as time goes by for two reasons. One, I think that Trump will not be president forever. And number two, I think as the Chinese threat becomes greater and greater, it will be, give the United States more and more incentives to behave in strategically smart ways. The problem we face, Tom and Kishore, is that during the unipolar moment, we were so powerful compared to all the other states in the system that we could afford to behave in reckless ways because there were no real consequences, because we were by far the most powerful great power in modern history. Well, that world has gone away. I think this is a point that Kishore and I agree on. With the rise of China, the United States is facing a potential peer competitor. And that will cause us, Tom, I think, to focus our mind and will begin to behave better or smarter at the micro level. My guests are John Mearsheimer from the University of Chicago. He's the author of, among other books, uh, The History of Great Power Politics, The Tragedy of Great Power Politics, published in 2001. A revised issue came out in 2014. And Kishore Mabobani, who joins us from Singapore, he's the author of Is China or Winning or Has China Won? And uh, that is available at all good bookstores uh, later in the month. Uh, Kishore, let me follow on from John and his point there about American preeminence in the region. I think there's a, a consensus here between the two of you uh, that the United States has badly mishandled relations with Russia and Europe more generally in the post-Cold War era. A ditto the Middle East in the post-9-11 era. It's badly damaged American credibility and prestige. But you both agree that America will remain a very powerful presence in East Asia. Keyshaw, how do you respond to the those folks, and they're not just the hawks in Washington or in Canberra, it's increasingly felt across Japan and South Korea, even in Europe, that China increasingly represents the number one strategic danger to the world, and moreover, the rest of the world must be less dependent on China for supply chains. Keyshaw. Uh, yes, I, I think it's... Um it's very reasonable to say, uh, you know, it's an old proverb, don't put your, all your eggs in one basket. And I would say, yes, you have to certainly uh, maybe reduce your reliance on China for, for the economic production. I think that, that, that's quite reasonable. But I want to emphasize, let's say, for example, take Japan. Japan is, as you know, the, the Prime Minister Abe is spending some money to move Japanese investments outside China to uh, ensure uh, Japan, and then so where where will the where will the investment move? They will, they'll move to to ASEAN countries, to Indonesia, Malaysia, Singapore, Thailand. But guess what? This Japanese investment will boost uh, ASEAN's uh, growth, and as ASEAN's economy grows, they will trade more with China. So it's not a zero sum game that we are playing at the end of the day uh, uh, on this uh, economic sphere. And here, I just want to uh, come back to a critical point that uh, John was uh, making earlier about how you manage China in this transition process. And I actually want to recommend a book that John wrote called American Diplomacy uh, with a new forward. Uh, and, you know, George Cannon gave very, very good advice. And 
John, correct me if I got the advice right, uh, for how to manage China. Sorry, Keisha, I was just explaining for everyone that uh, George Kennan, the intellectual architect of the Cold War Doctrine of Containment. Yep. That's right. So, uh, you know, just very quickly, four pieces of advice. Number one, uh, your, 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 your success will depend on your domestic spiritual vitality, what you do at home. Number two, cultivate friends and allies. Uh, number three, don't insult the Soviet Union because you've got to deal with the Soviet Union. Number four, be humble. So, you know, frankly, if the United States of America applied George Cannon's advice at the beginning of the Cold War in the management of China, we would have a very different world and we could manage the rise of China in such a way that our interests, whatever whatever you call your interests, are not necessarily jeopardized. You can actually find ways and means of working with each other. And that's what we should be striving to do. I'm not saying you should kowtow to China or jump at China's behest, but what you need to do is find intelligent ways and means of dealing with a new rising power. Well, John Mearsheimer, I mean, all the available public opinion polling evidence indicates that uh, the Americans are increasingly anxious about China. Anti-China sentiments are rising. This is bipartisan, both Democrats and Republicans. Why, why, why can't America take Kishore's advice and be humble and be, be more sensitive about China's uh, uh, enhancing regional profile? John? Because the United States cannot tolerate a situation where any great power dominates all of Asia, or any great power dominates all of Europe. The United States has a rich history of contesting any country that tries to dominate its region of the world and become a peer competitor of the United States. From a realist point of view, and as you both know, I'm a realist par excellence. In an anarchic system where there's no higher authority, it's very important to be powerful. It's very important to be more powerful than the other states in the system because that's the best way to survive. The Chinese understand this intuitively. They understand it explicitly. They understand that during the century of national humiliation, the biggest problem was that they were weak. They didn't have much power. They intend to have lots of power. They want to dominate Asia, but we don't want them to dominate Asia. One thing that I think that Kishore and I disagree on is I think international politics is very much a zero-sum game. As China gains, we lose. As we gain, China loses. And this is one of the reasons I think the competition is so intense. Now, if I can just make one more point. Kishore, you keep talking about George Kennan. George Kennan was the father of containment. He was interested in containing the Soviet Union. I'm interested in containing China. George Kennan is, uh, is at odds with you, and George Kennan and I are in the same <laughs> bailiwick. Uh, Keisho uh, Mababani. Well, I, 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 I don't know. I mean, I'm sure you know him better than I do, but I, knowing him and his writings, he was also very shrewd and very realistic. As you know, he opposed the Iraq war, uh, that the U.S. Uh, uh, blundered into, and I think he was a, if he was alive today, if he's a, if he's a realist, and if you are a realist, you got to consider the first question is: Is it realistic to think that you can contain China in the same way that you can con- that you contain the Soviet Union? Because the China is a is, is the exact opposite uh, of the Soviet Union. Because China actually in anticip- you're absolutely right, the Chinese. Uh, Want to, want to become strong and dominant. They anticipated this containment strategy even 20, 30 years ago, and therefore made sure that all of their neighbors traded more with China than they did with the United States. So you mentioned the five allies uh, uh, of the United States in, in East Asia, South Korea, Japan, Thailand, Philippines, Australia, unless I'm wrong, all five do more trade uh, with China than they do with the uh, uh, United States. So it is, it is an absolute mistake to think that you can take uh, some of the assumptions of the Soviet Union and apply them to, to China, because China is in many ways, and this is, of course, a John will completely disagree with me on this, it's a much more careful, strategic player. So, for example, I agree that China will try to become the dominant power but China will try to become the dominant power without using military means. 
in China, and, and Henry Kissinger in his book on China describes how the Chinese believe that the best way to win a war, as Sun Tzu said, is without fighting it. So the Chinese will become more assertive, their influence will grow. But the thing to note about China is that as it is rising as a great power, it hasn't fought a major war in 40 years. It hasn't fired a bullet across its border in 30 years. So it's a very different animal that you're competing with than when you're dealing with the Soviet Union. So it's important to discard some of the previous methods if you want to deal with the assertive China. If you just tuned in, you're at the Centre for Independent Studies with me, Tom Switzer, and I'm, my guests are Kishore Mabobani in Singapore and John Mearsheimer in Chicago. Uh, and remember, if you'd like to ask a question to our esteemed guests, simply type your questions into the chat section. Speaking of which, we have a question here from Jennifer Lind in Illinois in the United States. Thanks, Jennifer, for tuning in. Uh, question for John Mearsheimer. What spark would likely provoke hostilities with China? Can you please address the issue of Taiwan? Will China and the US go to war over Taiwan? One glance at the map would favour China in that question. John Mearsheimer. Well, I think there are three main uh, hot spots in East Asia. One is the South China Sea, uh, where the Chinese are uh, engaging in building uh, islets and turning uh, those small uh, mounds of territory in the South China Sea into military bases. Uh, the second is Taiwan. And the third is the East China Sea, where there are these rocks that are contested between Japan on one side uh, and China on the other. Those are the three hot spots in East Asia. I think the most likely place where you would get a war uh, between the United States and China, where you would actually have shooting, is over the South China Sea. Uh, I think that uh, it's also possible uh, that you could have a war over those other two uh, contingencies, one being Taiwan, two being the East China Sea. Uh, with regard to Taiwan, there's no question, uh, as Jennifer said in her question, that Taiwan is physically very close to the Chinese mainland, and it is roughly 6,000 miles from the California coast. So as time goes by, it becomes more and more difficult for the United States to defend Taiwan. It's a very tough contingency. I think that if you look at the military balance in Asia, Tom, it favors the United States now, and this is true with regard to defending Taiwan, but as time goes by and China becomes economically and militarily more powerful, it becomes increasingly difficult for the United States to defend Taiwan, to fight a conflict in the South China Sea or the East China Sea. Yeah, Keisha, on that note, in Taiwan uh, last January, the pro-independence-leaning Democratic Progressive Party of President Tsai Ing-wen it was returned overwhelming landslide election, 58% of the vote, which is just astonishing. And most people believe that was widely seen as a repudiation of Beijing. Um, should, shouldn't Beijing take into account the widespread views of the Taiwanese people when they address this question of Taiwan, formerly known as Formosa? Kishore. Well, uh, you know, um, to answer that question, you have to know the history of how Taiwan became separated from China. And earlier on, John referred to the century of humiliation that China suffered. And as you know, during the century of humiliation from 1842 to 1949, uh, the British came, forced China to accept opium, seize Hong Kong, seize territories in, in, in China had settlements and uh, sacked the Summer Palace. And then, of course, the Japanese came and defeated the Chinese in 1895 and seized Taiwan. So Taiwan, the most important thing as far as the Chinese are concerned, is the last symbol of the century of humiliation that China has suffered. So I can tell you that if any, you, you, you talk of the people's sentiments, any Chinese leader who appears in the eyes of 1.4 billion people to be weak on Taiwan is toast because it's seen as the last symbol of what's happening. So if you want to factor in 
the sentiments of people, be careful what you're doing to the sentiments of 1.4 billion people. But having said that, I also believe that there can be a peaceful solution uh, to the Taiwan issue. And it's a simple case of live and let live. And as you know, paradoxically, the geopolitical space of Taiwan under President Ma Yingju, they were allowed to participate in World Health Organization, increased when the Taiwanese didn't, didn't have a government that wants to push for any kind of independence. But the minute the Taiwanese government tries to push for independence, its geopolitical space shrinks. So if you really want to help the people of Taiwan, and I want to help the people of Taiwan, at the end of the day, the Taiwanese have got to be realistic and realize that there are, you know, 193 countries in the world, right? Apart from a few mini states that recognize Taiwan, none of the major states are going to recognize Taiwan. And, you know, Taiwan's fate was sealed in 1979 when the United States de-recognized Taiwan and recognized China as the government. So once that happened, that's when history turned the corner. So it's a difficult issue, but the, the, the best way we can help the people of Taiwan is try not to politicize the issue, and that will give them more space in the geopolitical environment. Let's turn to the broader issue of containment, the strategy that John Mishama recommends. We have a question here from Mitch in Sydney. Question, should we revive uh, and expand the quadrilateral security dialogue? This, of course, includes the United States, Australia, uh, Japan and India. Should we revive and, and, and actually expand it after COVID-19? I'm assuming he means to expand it to, say, Vietnam and South Korea. This might be the best counterbalance strategy to China, but how willing would these nations be in containing China? And I should stress, John, uh, the United States has been very keen for allies to support its freedom of navigation patrols through that 12 nautical mile zone in the South China Sea. How would you respond to Mitch, John Mearsheimer? Well, I think that the United States has a deep-seated interest in creating an alliance structure or a balancing coalition against China. This is what containment is all about. Just as we created NATO in Europe during the Cold War, and we created an alliance structure in East Asia, mainly involving Japan and South Korea, what we have to do now in the face of the rise of China is create a balancing coalition that includes those four countries for sure, but includes other countries as well. As well. And the United States has to operate on the assumption that all of those countries, although they have close economic ties with China, will privilege security concerns over economic concerns. They will be fearful of China to the point where they will be willing to ally with the United States. This does not mean that all of the economic intercourse that takes place between these countries and China will come to an end. You want to remember that in Europe before World War I, you had a great deal of economic intercourse between the countries that ended up fighting each other in World War I. So you can have security competition and significant economic cooperation at the same time. But the key question is whether or not the United States can put together this balancing coalition, this alliance structure in East Asia to contain China. And when you look at the Trump administration and how well or poorly it's performed in the realm of foreign policy over the past three years, you begin to worry because the Trump administration has not done a good job of cobbling together this alliance. And in the future, the Trump administration or the Biden administration, who is ever in the White House, is going to have to do a much better job. And I think it is doable in large part because I think almost all countries in East Asia are very scared of the Chinese. Kishore, you and John, although you express yourselves in different ways, you, you, you are acknowledging uh, that all rising great powers, as they rise, their definition of national interests grows as their power increases, and they seek a sphere of influence in areas on which their future stability and prosperity uh, rely. There's nothing odd about that. All great powers have done it. Look at the United States in the 19th century. Uh, and of course, the Chinese in internal discussions with the Americans say, you did this in the 19th century with your Monroe Doctrine. Why can't we in China do it in East Asia? 
Um, but when I put this question to uh, Paula Dobriansky from um, uh, Washington, she's a former senior official in the Bush administration, the second Bush administration, and she said that, well, we tolerated slavery in the early 19th century. That doesn't mean you, you allow great powers, spheres of influence in the 21st century. How would you respond to those kind of concerns? Because there's, they're concerns you'll hear on both left and right in public discourse. Yeah, well, for a start, uh, um, let me say that I want to quote what uh, Graham Allison uh, says in his book, Destined for War. He says, you know, many Americans often say, why can't China be like us? <laughs> and Graham Allison says, be careful what you wish for, because China today, in, in its point of emergence, is exactly where the United States was at the end of 19th century and then Teddy Roosevelt came along and started wars, seized territories, and that was normal emerging great power behavior. So, and, and the, the remarkable thing about China today is that there is no Teddy Roosevelt in China who is trying to go around, declare wars, seize territories, and so on and so forth. So China's emergence in that sense so far has been very different uh, from the way that uh, uh, America has behaved. And there is absolutely no question that as China becomes strong and more muscular, it will become more assertive. I mean, let's, it, this, is what, this is how all great powers behave. And in that sense, uh, I agree with Mearsheimer. As a realist, we must understand that great powers want more, more space for themselves. But it's, it's also important to understand how China will uh, assert its power. And I think the Fundamental difference, I think, between the way the United States has behaved, and indeed, uh, uh, John Mearsheimer's book has got this amazing number of statistics, the number of wars that the United States has fought in the last 30 years. It's been at war for almost every, every other year or every two years out of three years over the last 30 years. Now, that, that, that's the American impulse. The Chinese impulse, and this goes back a long time, is to try and win a war without fighting it. And I think this is where... Kissinger's book on China is worth reading because he does point out how patiently they will try to accumulate assets and influence and they can, they can, so they can expand their space without necessarily having to go to war. And, and the other side of the coin, I also must emphasize that since we are talking of Japan, uh, South Korea, India, I would say that in, when things happen in Asia, it's never black and white, okay? You can see very subtle changes in the shades of gray. And you must be able to wear Asian glasses to see how the shades of gray are changing. And just to give you a, 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 something which I hope is undeniable, in theory today, Thailand and Philippines, in theory, are allies of the United States. Yes, they have a defense treaty, but you know, honestly, do you think seriously the current governments in Philippines and the current government in Thailand is closer to Washington DC than it is to Beijing? Something has changed. So on paper, they remain treaty allies. Functionally, they're far more sensitive to what Beijing is doing. And, and so these are the subtle changes we have to understand. It's a very different game. It's not a game being played with aircraft carriers, missiles, and so on and so forth. China, as you know, still only has 300 nuclear missiles compared to 6, for the, over 6,000 for the US. It's a different game. And so dealing with China, you cannot use the same 90 yeah, well, on that note, John Mearsheimer, uh, Australia, like many of the countries in the region, just sorry, Keisha, we're losing you there. Uh, many countries in the region, most notably Australia and Japan, have this rock, bedrock security alliance with the United States. Of course, we don't want to say we're choosing between going with China or going with America. But as a supporter of a containment strategy led by the United States in East Asia, how worried are you, John Mearsheimer, by Keisha Marbulbani's point that U.S. allies like the Philippines and Thailand are getting very cozy with Beijing, so much so that Thailand, I understand, is even buying Chinese submarines. John Mishama. Well, I think what's happening with the Philippines is worrisome. Uh, and I think the United States has not done a good job of wooing the Filipinos away from China and from forming closer relations with the Chinese. Uh, I think with regard to countries like Australia, Japan, South Korea, India, uh, there's no major problem. 
I think there are a number of cases. Thailand is another one where the United States is going to have to get much more sophisticated in dealing with those countries to keep those countries in America's orbit and outside of China's orbit. If I could just say one thing just on Kishore uh, in his notion of putting on Asian glasses uh, and, and this idea that Asians are part of this culture that thinks about the world differently than we Westerners do. It's a view that I don't share at all. And I would just note to you, Kishore, that when I go to China, which I do quite frequently, I feel intellectually much more at home in China than I do in the United States. <laughs> Chinese are my kind of people because the Chinese <laughs> are really the core. So I don't have this sense that the Chinese reject realism and have this Confucian or very esoteric Asian way of doing business. They seem to me to talk and act just like the great powers that I think about and write about. And before Keyshaw deals with that, uh, we got a question here from Phil Backman in Victoria, and he says for Keyshaw, your thinking seems more subtle, conciliatory, realistic than that of many Westerners. Is that reflective of your culture or of your personal character? And I should stress that one of your books, Keyshaw, was <laughs> published in the 1990s, Can <laughs> Asians Think? Oh, and Harry said it was that you are the most forceful, combative, insightful spokesman for the new Asia um, how would you respond to John Mishama there, Keishal? No, actually, no, I, I, actually, I, I'm not surprised at all that John feels very much at home in, in China because the Chinese, uh, our Chinese think very strategically and think very long term and actually would actually agree with John uh, quite a bit. But I, I also have to emphasize that the, 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 the means by which China is flexing its muscles and growing its influence is, 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 is using predominantly non-military means. Well, well, let me say, by the way, so far, so let's, let's uh, I, I, there comes a point in time where if you provoke the Chinese at a certain point, then of course they're going to react uh, militarily. That's, 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 so that, 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 that's my goal. My goal is to see whether or not we can create a world where the fundamental interests of the United States in taking care of the well-being of 330 million people and the fundamental interest of China in taking care of 1.4 billion Chinese people does not come to a clash and that they can actually live with each other. And that, that I think, is the key point of difference that I have uh, with John. John assumes that there has to be a clash. I, I believe there can be a live and that live uh, policy. And frankly, most of the countries in the region, I think, would be happier if, yes, there can be geopolitical competition between US and China, which you cannot stop, but do it in such a way that you don't force other countries to choose. And I have a whole chapter about the 6 billion people who live outside the US and China, and most of them actually are now wishing, especially with COVID-19, that both US and China would press the pause button on the strategic competition and fight COVID-19 together. So it is therefore a different world from the world that we grew up in the past. That's the key point I'm emphasizing. Okay, now we only have a few minutes left, but we've got time for a few more questions. Uh, John Mearsheimer, mean, let's look at the internal makeup of the United States. Anne Kane uh, asks, how will Joe Biden and the Democrats handle China if he wins in November? And Lydia from Melbourne asks the question, um, should allies like Australia be concerned about staying power? In one of your earlier answers, you said uh, America... Uh, will remain very much engaged in East Asia. East Asia. That's also Keyshaw's view. Uh, but Lydia points to an article in the Atlantic magazine. George Parker argues, America is a failed state. Quote, a corrupt political class, a sclerotic bureaucracy, a heartless economy, a divided and distracted public. The coronavirus, he argues, did not break America. It revealed what was already broken. Now, John, Lydia asked a question, to the extent that Packer is right and the trends continue, do they contradict the notion of American regional preeminence for the foreseeable future? John. Well, there are certain virtues to the Packer piece, which we don't have time to get into here. 
But the idea that the United States is a broken state and is going to have to come crawling back across or swimming back across the Pacific Ocean to the California shores because it doesn't have the staying power to remain in East Asia is not a serious argument. We are an incredibly rich country. We have incredibly ambitious foreign policy goals. And as I said earlier, Tom, there is no evidence whatsoever that we are leaving East Asia. And if you look at the historical record, there's no reason to think that we're going to leave. The more important issue, which I think is captured by the Packer article to some extent and captured by the other question, is the one of whether or not the United States can actually manage its relations with its allies in East Asia. And the reason I hope that Biden wins from a foreign policy view is I think that Joseph Biden would do a much better job managing our alliance relations in East Asia and indeed managing relations with the Chinese than the Trump administration has done. So it's the actual management of containment how we're putting together the balancing coalition uh, that I find uh, unsatisfactory. And I blame that largely on the Trump administration, which tends to treat allies poorly. Okay, finally, Keyshaw, uh, we have uh, someone, Sally from Perth. She's asking, are you overstating uh, China's rise and overlooking its very real weaknesses and limitations? And she points out that the economy has gone into its first recession since its transition to a market economy. Its population is aging fast. It has various internal ethnic tensions and has become embroiled in this trade war with China. So so are you sugarcoating China's problems, Keisho Mababani? Uh, well, you know, she may be absolutely right that, 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 that China will uh, crumble and fail in the face of all these problems. Yes, it can happen. But, you know, at the end of the day, if you are a serious strategic planner and you're looking after the interests of your country, do you plan for the best case outcome that China disappears? Or do you plan for the worst case outcome in which China becomes really, really strong and powerful? And I, think I must emphasize one small thing. The Chinese are no less smart than their East Asian neighbors. They can achieve the per capita income of South Korea, Japan, and Singapore someday. And when they do so, the Chinese GNP will be phenomenal. And that's a different world. And so let us ask ourselves, what happens if China succeeds? How do we deal with that world? And what kind of China do we want to see? That's why this great, we are in a moment of great transition. What I'm advocating is a wiser way of managing China that avoids pulling its tail and saying, hey, we now have to deal with a new reality. Let's try to make sure we can preserve our interests and keep enough space. And also, by the way, as I emphasize, keep the United States in the region, not throw it out. So let's work together to create a peaceful and stable outcome. And I, in that, in that sense, I'm an optimist. It can be done. Well, Keishaw Marbulbani in Singapore and John Mearsheimer in Chicago, on behalf of my colleagues and all of us listening, thank you so much for this really stimulating discussion. And it seems to me it's a good way to conclude with some remarks by my colleague and fellow board member here at CIS, James Phillips. He says, the conceit that Australia's and America's belief that their values and system would prevail in the medium term made Australia naive in its engagement with China. Now it's woken up but it's not being careful in picking the issues on which it pokes the tiger. Thank you. Thanks, Tom, and Keyshaw. Thanks, John. Thanks, Keyshaw. Great work, guys. That was terrific. Mm -hmm.